Welcome, everybody. Good evening. I'm Gabriel Rosenfeld, the president here at the Center for Jewish History. And uh, perhaps more importantly, in the context of tonight's event, I'm the co-editor, along with my good friend Janet Ward, of the volume Fascism in America. So why are we here tonight? Uh, partly it's a matter of shedding light on anniversaries. Just over 100 years ago, on November 9th, 1923, Germany, as of course you're probably familiar, withstood the attempt of Adolf Hitler's Nazi party to overthrow the German government in a violent coup. Just three years ago next month, on January 6, 2021, the United States survived a similar attempt by domestic right-wing extremists to prevent the newly elected American President Joe Biden from being certified as the winner of the 2000 presidential election. Juxtaposing these two notorious events in German and US history is instructive for it reveals not only how the German past sheds light on the American present, but how American history itself is marked by fascist tendencies. Our new edited volume, Fascism in America, Past and Present, gathers scholars from the fields of both German and US history to weigh in on a question that has preoccupied a growing international audience since the election of Donald Trump as 45th President of the United States in 2016, and that is, is the United States in danger of succumbing to fascism? Tonight, we're enormously fortunate that seven of our volume's 14 contributors are with us to discuss this question from a historical perspective. Uh, I'm afraid to have to announce that our eighth panelist, Ruth Ben-Ghiat, uh, is under the weather and could not make it tonight. Um, but the seven uh, panelists who are here will, of course, be uh, sharing their important perspectives on this topic that is bringing us all here this evening. Uh, so let me just say one or two words about the format uh, for tonight's event. Uh, we will be having an extended conversation in two shifts, one led by Janet. She'll be sitting here as the moderator of the first session together with four uh, participants. And the second one uh, will be moderated by myself with three participants. The first session will be focusing on the origins of fascism in America. The second session will be focusing on responses to fascism in America. Um, we will be having a short Q&A session of about 10, 12 minutes after each of the two sessions, so they'll be done in staggered uh, fashion. Um, there will be note cards that I think probably already have. Um, after the third uh, speaker is done uh, speaking and answering the questions posed by Janet, um, we'll be collecting uh, the questions on the aisle here, and then um, Janet will be winnowing through uh, the questions to see how we can move forward with Q&A. Um, We'll have a reception, of course, uh, after the event. There'll be a chance to buy the book, have a yearbook-style signing uh, ceremony um, with as many or as few of the uh, authors giving their John Hancocks, as they say. Um, and uh, yeah, we're really excited for a, a, a very informative and um, sort of educational evening. Um, I'd like to now call up my uh, friend Janet Ward, although you don't have to physically come up just yet but I want to give her her proper introduction. Uh, Janet is the Brammer Presidential Professor of History and Faculty Fellow for Strategic Initiatives at the University of Oklahoma. In 2022 and 2023, Janet served as an American Council on Education Fellow at Yale University. She's the author or co-editor of seven books, including Postwall Berlin, Borders, Space, and Identity, and the forthcoming book, Sites of Holocaust Memory. She's also the immediate past president of the German Studies Association. So Janet, if I can have you and the first four panelists come up to the stage here, we can get started. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. So Gabrielle and I, in our respective moderator roles, will ask each of the panelists one or two questions on the same theme, namely, how does your contribution to our book shed light on the question of fascism in America, past and present, and of course, looking to the future as well. 
As Gabrielle said, the first part of our discussion this evening will be on the origins of fascism. I'll first introduce our group of panelists, then I'll ask a question of each of them in turn, as Gabrielle said, for them to respond to. And then we'll open up the discussion with all of you. So Gabrielle and I encourage you right now to start thinking of your own questions for our panelists using the cards being distributed so that we can collect them. We'll start this evening by welcoming Dr. Linda Gordon. Linda teaches history right here in New York at NYU, and her most recent book from 2017 is The Second Coming of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan in the American Political Tradition. And her new study of American social movements, including American fascist groups from the 1930s, is forthcoming. Linda is one of the very few historians to win the Bancroft Prize, not just once, but twice. For her book, The Great Arizona Orphan Abduction, a story of vigilante action against Mexican Americans, and for her biography of Dorothea Langer, A Life Beyond Limits. So Linda, please tell us, how do you understand the American fascist tradition? You are very well known as a leading historian of the KKK. Some have called the KKK, quote, the first fascist organization. You, however, have drawn distinctions between the two. Please tell us, where do these distinctions lie? Okay, thanks, thank you for that. Uh, that's a very fulsome introduction. Uh, please, if, I, if this wanders too far from my mouth, could you wave your hand and let me know because I'm not used to having to hold it and talk at the same time. Um, what Janice said, I'm, I think probably clues you in, but let me just say bluntly that I come to this because the Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s was a major parent, if not the parent, of the American fascist groups of the 1930s, of which there were more than 100. But what I want to talk about here is whether we can distinguish the politics of the Ku Klux Klan from that of fascists, because I, I actually would not label the Klan fascist, but it certainly shares many uh, what I call fascistic uh, attitudes. Um, and I, w I want to say, to start with, that I prefer the word fascistic when I'm talking about this, because to, to name things fascism almost often implies to people that there is a standard core that is universal to what constitutes fascism. Um, I love this particular quote from, quote from Umberto Eco, who said, fascism has no quintessence. The fa fascist game can be played in many forms. So I want to start by distinguishing what's fascistic from what has recently been called populist. And I have to say recent because historians who know anything about American history know that there was a populist party at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century that was actually on the whole a very progressive uh, party. Um, I won't go into how, how this word took on different connotations, but I'm sure you're familiar with the, today's pejorative use, or to us, pejorative use of, of the word populist. First, uh, and these are things that I think fascists and populists have in common. First, you might point out that they mobilize support by promoting resentment of outsiders, notably immigrants or people of the wrong race, ethnicity, or religion. They do this with the claim that these uh, outsiders are victimizing, quote unquote, the people. In other words, these outsiders are really not part of the people in this kind of discourse. But it's also clear that in talking about how the, peop the uh, people are being victimized, they're doing something that's also very characteristic of populist right-wing movements, and that is they cast blame downward toward low, less advantaged groups rather than upward toward the people who actually have power. Uh, both, uh, in a different way, both populists and fascists often display a kind of extreme nationalism uh, 
which takes, particularly in the 1920s, the form of a great suspiciousness of any foreign ideas and culture. And uh, in connection with the, anti, with the anti-Semitism that was characteristic of these pop, clan populists, well, the fascists, it, um, it has to do with the fact that the Jews are essentially foreigners. They are not really of the people. Um, furthermore, they, the populist and fascist type often spend a time condemning what we might call the political establishment. Uh, they are not critical of uh, what you might talk, talk about corporate power. Instead, they offer what I think of as a kind of deformed class analysis. And in this class analysis, it is intellectuals, experts, secular people, big city people, who are the people who theoretically have power and are driving this country in a bad direction. Uh, uh, associated with that is a great suspicion of big cities uh, because big cities are the home of cosmopolitanism. What they uh, produce is people who are not sufficiently patriotic because they are very interested in the rest of the world. And of course, above all, because cities are diverse. This is a fundamental aspect of cities. Although, uh, you know, we can find some surprising things here, and the, including the fact that the Ku Klux Klan in the 20s was very strong in numerous big cities. So there is a kind of incoherence that you find uh, in general with this. Um, the class analysis that wants to blame uh, experts and so on is part of another stream, which we might call anti-intellectualism, uh, a kind of suspicious not only of the people who do it, but of the kind of learning that leads them to this errant cosmopolitanism. I'll, another aspect of this so-called, what I call a class analysis, is a very strong tendency to lean on conspiracy theories as explanations for the world's problems. So that instead of seeking structural, economic, uh, political um, sources for these problems, it's much easier to find a particular enemy. And I know we're, repeat, we're hearing some of that today, but it's a very, very core aspect in the sense that conspiracy thinking is very core, I think, to most populism and to fascism itself. Um, one result also of the suspicion of people who are not, quote, the people, is that they're quite willing to override what we today might call civil liberties, uh, the protection of minorities, and at times, even the rule of law. Uh, this is complicated in the case of both fascists and uh, populists in the United States because I think a lot of people aren't aware of this, a very, very a, a significant proportion of the membership of those groups were, in fact, police officers. So the question of enforcing the rule of law then becomes kind of slippery, so we can get to that later. Uh, these groups are also, um, although in the 20s and 30s, I think this was not as prominent as it is today, they were also typically very anti-feminist. They condemned alternative family forms, uh, they certainly would have condemned uh, gay people to the extent that they even knew that such existed. They certainly would be hostile to what sometimes today is called by its enemies, quote unquote, gender ideology, um, in the sense that uh, there's a contrasting belief that we are all, that our gender is what we were born with. It is not something that is socially constructed and therefore cannot also be easily changed. Uh, they, they didn't know about surgery. Um, the, but particularly as part of this, the act of resentment is the claim that uh, women are victimizing men. Now this is, I, I have to be clear, this is a subordinate, uh, somewhat uh, hidden part of the discourse of the populace and the fascists, but it's part of 
uh, blaming, uh, blaming your gang downward, to blame the people who are less privileged than others. But they are also in, often in alliance with religious evangelicals or fundamentalists, mainly Christian in the US, but as I'm sure you well know, this is true of, uh, of Jews, Muslims, Hindus, etc. that you find that kind of fundamentalism and assertion that there is one right way to be here. Um, there's also a tendency that they both have to use what I call a hyper-masculinism. It's closely connected to a kind of demagogic, angry, performative way of speaking in which the purpose of the speak of a public speak is to, well, you might say, rile up. It is as much as opposed to presenting information or facts. Um, now, I make no claim that this list is inclusive, and uh, I'm sh and furthermore, I, w I do want to be clear that all of these things, populism, fascism, uh, take on. Uh, the, uh, the form that fits the cultures in which they operate. There is no universal here. But nevertheless, I think we can use some of these uh, notions about uh, populists at, to contrast with what happened when fascists really started to arise big time in the United States. Um, let me say first that there were probably about 100 small fascist groups. They were extremely small but they were also extremely violent. And this is the first point I want to raise as a point of comparison. When many people think of the Ku Klux Klan, we think of uh, the Southern Klan, which I categorize as a terrorist group that used lynching and attacks of all kinds on African Americans, not just to punish particular Americans, but like terrorists do, in order to frighten anyone else around who might uh, have any friendship or common cause with them. The new Ku Klux Klan succeeded in the North because it was mainly nonviolent, and succeeded is an understatement. The 1920s Ku Klux Klan had somewhere between three and five million members. And being a member of the Klan was not cheap. You had to uh, pay lots of money and dues and so on. In fact, the Ku Klux Klan uh, of the 20s was actually a for-profit corporation. Uh, that's a little complicated, so I won't, I won't go more into that. Um, but the Klan was also extremely isolationist. They wanted nothing to do with foreign countries where, by contrast, the fascists were, to put it mildly, in love with the fascist and Nazi regimes that are em emerging in Europe. And in fact, uh, the, American, uh, the American fascist groups actually received financial support directly from Nazi Germany. Um, the second thing that was a really radical change between the Klan and the fascists is that the Klan, that the Klan had been equally hostile to Catholicism and, and Judaism. Their strength was a certain kind of evangelical Protestantism. The fascists came along and entirely dumped the anti-Catholicism. And that's in part because of the influence of a very important fascist leader, Charles Coughlin, who was a priest in, out of Detroit. But what you get here is the absolute concentration of this hostility uh, to Jews. And I might say, more so even, that I mean, sure, there were plenty racist toward people of color, but that was not, uh, that was not their driving cause. Um, they justified their violence because it was a necessary means to protect, quote, the people from their internal enemies. And I don't need to go on about who those internal enemies know. But this violence was lessened only by the very small numbers of the fascist groups. The largest one was the German-American Bund, which may have had something like a thousand or two members, and it was the least violent. Uh, I, I can talk more if people want to know later about the specifics of the fascist groups. Now, they also were extremely uh, 
loyal to a concept of authoritarian leadership, and that too was different from the Klan. The, uh, the need for authoritarian leadership was because only that could really save the country and take the country to, and this is another uh, point that they made a lot, to its destiny. And this is this point of similarity in that the, both the Klan and the fascists had a notion that there was a destiny uh, to particular countries. I'm sure people who are familiar with uh, German fascism are familiar with, familiar with that idea. Um, but in many cases in the Klan, the uh, defense of authoritarianism was, became a secular form of religious submission to a deity. Uh, I'm not saying that they were, uh, they were um, you know, breaking with the traditional dictates of Christianity, but there was a real shift toward attributing to secular leaders some of the qualities that they wanted to associate with other leaders. Um, some people have identified, following Theodore Adorno, this kind of desire to submit to authorities as a form of authoritarian personality. And I think that's, there's a lot there that one can think about. But what's important here is that we understand that authoritarian personalities are created. Uh, it's true that some people may have had what we want to call that as a way of, that attracted them to these groups. But once you're in these groups, there's a tremendous amount of socialization to uh, behaving in that authoritarian way. Um, Another major difference, though, was what the Klan versus the fascists proposed as to how they would go about freeing the nation from these outsiders who were very evil. The, the Klan engaged in a lot of nonviolent economic uh, warfare. Uh, they tried to organize boycotts of stores that were uh, run by uh, Jews and Catholics, and they totally failed, at least in relation to the, the uh, department stores, which at the time were predominantly owned by Jews. And you can, uh, what I saw is that women who are accustomed to shopping in these places were not going to be deterred because the Klan told them that the Jews were bad. Um, the, the, the Klan proposed in various times, in various ways, that you get rid of these people either by deporting them or by converting them because you could convert in their view, uh, and this is a, a, a difference between them and the fascists. To them, Judaism was a religion as well as something else, and you could leave it or join it. Um, but a, a really hugely important difference here is that they did not, the Klan, and again, I, I want to separate the Northern Klan from the Southern Klan because the Southern Klan was definitely uh, uh, on a path toward wanting to just eliminate any uh, upward, uppity blacks, but the, the Ku Klux Klan was not doing that. They wanted to try in many ways to deprive these bad people of power. And they did this through a massive electoral campaign. And let me just say a couple words about that. Um, the Klan was very, very influential, if not primarily responsible, for the 1924 Immigration Restriction Act, which was uh, the law of the United States for 40 years, and which was an act, I'm sure you all know of, that assigned quotas to various national immigrants. Um, an example is a quota of 100 for all of Africa. Uh, the, clan, the, the, lead, the Senate leader who, who uh, saw this leg, uh, legislation to passage was himself not only a member of the Klan, but a key organizer of the Klan. But what you get when you're talking, when you move to talk about fascists is something that is much more both violent much more thoroughgoing. Uh, American fascists did not usually get into this totally, total notion uh, that the Nazis have of just obliterating uh, of a genocide. 
but they did have ideas, for example, that you might encourage all the Jewish people to move and settle together in particular places so they would not be mixed up with and therefore influencing other people. Um, yeah, I've got one more sentence really. <laughs> Um, however useful it is to conceptualize a, a populism-fascism continuum or distinction, uh, neither label, I want to say, it seems to me adequate to our contemporary dangers. Um, labels actually can stand in the way of specifics. They can inhibit close observation and analysis of what they see is actually happening. My list of populist features is not a checklist from which we can diagnose, categorize, and label. Uh, new features will always appear. New cultures are going to produce different forms of this, this particular sort of uh, political stance. That's it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Linda. <laughs> Our second panelist this evening is Dr. Richard steigman Gall. Uh, Richard is an associate professor of history at Kent State University, and he is especially well known for his book called The Holy Reich, Nazi Conceptions of Christianity, 1919 to 1945, published with Cambridge University Press. He's currently researching the ideological origins of American fascism. Richard's awards include grants from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, the Max Planck Institute, and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. So Richard, your essay for our volume focuses on the Silver Shirts movement. What is notable about them in the 1930s? Are they an example of a domestic or a foreign phenomenon? And what was distinct about the anti-Semitism of the leader of the Silver Shirts, William Pelly? Uh, okay, this just got turned on, thank you. Um, thank you, Janet, for that uh, fulsome introduction. I, I should say, by way of preface, that uh, as, as much as um, I agreed with how it is, Dr. Gordon, that you, you detailed the Klan's ideology, I will immediately confess that I do consider it fascism, and uh, as is often the case in these debates, it becomes a, a, a question of hair-splitting and, uh, and all of us, of course, see the danger. The question of the label is important, though, I think, as you pointed out, uh, not least because of the emotional gravity that comes with uh, someone's decision to, as somebody said, uh, when the debate first got started in this country in 2016, uh, the utility of using the F word. So um, I do use uh, this word historically, uh, as well as in, contemporary, in the contemporary setting. Um, the, uh, the question you asked, uh, Janet, as to the, um, the, the, for lack of a better phrase, the native quality of this particular organization that I examined in my contribution to our volume, it's called the Silver Shirts. Some of you will have perhaps heard of them, also known as the Silver Legion. Uh, they were a bona fide shirted organization. Uh, they had all the requisite uh, uh, trappings of a fascist movement, jack boots. Uh, they didn't have an armband. They had emblazoned on their chests the letter L. Uh, I, I suspect somebody in the audience could guess what that L stood for. Sure enough, Liber liberty. Can't be American. Uh, you can't be an American fascist and not proclaim your commitment to liberty. After all, so. Um, as a, as a shirted movement, this is one of the many uh, dozens, as Dr. Gordon pointed out, of uh, movements, far-right movements, which I think most scholars would say, sure, okay, that's fascist, I'm seeing shirts, I'm seeing goose-stepping, I'm, I'm seeing jackboots. Um, the question, I think, of the silver shirts is an interesting one because it opens up many of these broader discussions as to does the F word apply in an American context? For instance, we know that the silver shirts are very often presumed to have started after Hitler's so-called Machtergreifung, right, the ascension to power at the end of January 1933. And it's after that date where they start actually um, uh, garbing themselves, most literally, in these accoutrements. In fact, uh, the silver shirts already had existed, at least in more granular form, uh, 
uh, in the 1920s, uh, most interestingly in the Pacific uh, Northwest, uh, but other places as well. So um, when it comes to this question, I think the real valence of this topic, right, is th this question of the homegrown nature of fascism. Must fascism always be an import? Um, so uh, Professor Gordon gestured in some ways to this presumption. How many of you will have seen uh, Night at the Garden, this documentary that came out, uh, what is it, four or five years ago, right? What is the most notorious moment in the history of American fascism? The night when the German-American Bund come to Manhattan and behind the leaders speaking at the podium, you see these images of George Washington next to a swastika. How perverse, how un-American. What, what a clear attempt to finagle an audience into believing something that nobody could believe, right? What is the subtext? Foreign import, right? And it's not just uh, people of German heritage in this country. Italian Americans also had a fascist organization, less heard of, called the, the White Shirts um, and other uh, organizations aside. And so when we, when we look at these uh, more sort of obviously frightening uh, iterations of uh, extreme politics in the interwar period, there's a tendency to look at these organizations and say, and I don't suggest for a second that Professor Gordon made this case, but it, it's, it's, it's part of the sort of discursive ecosystem. Ah, not made of American stuff, right? This isn't Mayflower. So uh, what interests me about the silver shirts is that they seem to be Mayflower, for lack of a better phrase, star-spangled. Uh, they are not an import. Uh, there's no indication that uh, the leader of the silver shirts, this one particular sort of granular case in points that I devote my chapter to in our book, uh, uh, William Dudley Pillay somehow went to you know, training camp in Munich or Bayreuth or Nuremberg. Um, so I, I think when we look at this question of the inherent importedness of fascism uh, and the utility of the category to describe not just the past of American politics in the 20s and 30s, but also its possible you know, presence in American politics today, there's a real concern among people that not only is it an emotional trigger, ah, well, if you start using this word, you're never going to reach your audience, but that it also isn't a shoe that fits and we should stop using this word in an American context. No one less than Leo Rebuffo, who is a really eminent scholar of the far right uh, in the historical uh, period leading up to the 40s, absolutely insisted this was a word that could not be used. Even though uh, in ways that I found very uh, informative, Dr. Gordon lists off all of these elements, anti-Semitism, misogyny, hyper-masculinity, right? uh, gender normativity, the list went on. In ways that as a scholar of fascism, I, I couldn't help but notice, well, goodness, that's, that is a shoe that seems to fit. So my own priors coming to this debate are, I'm a Europeanist, as many of us are, interestingly, in this collection of essays. Right? Many of us are actually um, trained as Europeanists saw the utility of uh, the, f the um, concept of fascism and started to wonder, gosh, it's, it seems to have suitability. So I think it's important when we look at the silver shirts in particular um, that it's not just so a movement that sort of aped European models. It, it existed before Hitler's rise to power. Um, and when we, when we acknowledge this, then the question becomes what are some possible antecedents, right? If fascism doesn't always have to be an import any more than liberalism or socialism have to be European imports either, then the question becomes what would have been some natively American star-spangled sort of antecedents of this fascism? And uh, of course, uh, Janet, in your initial comments, you pointed out that, uh, you, without mentioning him, Bob Paxton, right? Robert Paxton, uh, emeritus at Columbia University in his splendid book, Anatomy of Fascism, is the one who in fact says that the KKK is the world's first fascist movement before the, the word fascism was even in our parlance, uh, that could that be an obvious um, antecedent for an American case, but so could others who never wore a shirt, never wore jackboots, never wore an armband. Tom Watson, 
right? One of the most notorious moments in the history of American anti-Semitism was the Leo Frank case, right? Many people in the audience here will be familiar with this case. Uh, a Jewish man lynched on an accusation of raping a Gentile woman in Atlanta some 100 plus years ago, right? Tom Watson, a uh, demagogic journalist, uh, used this opportunity, uh, had previously been considered a progressive, becomes increasingly demagogic, anti-Semitic, and racist. This kind of transformation was in fact deeply typical of European fascists. Let's not forget the original fascist, Benito Mussolini, was a leading socialist before World War I. Right? He was the editor of the Italian socialist newspaper Avanti, even as four or five years later, at the end of World War I, he will start to violently assault his uh, former colleagues in the Italian fascist party. Um, to get to this larger then second question, and I'm sorry for coming out to it only now, Janet, um, my particular uh, investigation concerned, in fact, the virulence of Pele's anti-Semitism, which, <coughs> again, not to consciously uh, challenge anything that uh, Professor Gordon was saying, in fact, at one point in his, his many newspapers, many of which are housed in this wonderful archive in the Center for Jewish History, uh, was his paper, The Liberator, or uh, pardon me, Liberation, which um, just after Kristallnacht in uh, Germany, he was uh, reporting on what he saw in terms of current events uh, transatlantically, wrote an article in which he said that American Jewish Americans should be all sterilized. This was published um, just after Kristallnacht. He said, we should do what started in Germany should be finished in the United States. This is not in some diary. This is not a letter to a friend that only came out after his passing. Uh, this was published in his newspaper, um, which of course, even if you're not murdering people, clearly has genocidal intent, right? Uh, so when you look at, it's a small organization. It never had more than 35,000 members. Pele, rather amusingly, ran for president in 1936, maybe got 4,000 votes. Right? So that, that seems to say, well, why, why should we worry? Right? Um, I think what's interesting, again, to sort of riff off of uh, Dr. Gordon's comment, so many of these fascist organizations, so minute, right? One interesting point of comparison, and I'll leave it here, as a Europeanist, you know, my comparisons with uh, transatlantic cases is constantly popping into my head, would be the case of France. Some of you will know, perhaps, in France, there were over a dozen fascist parties, and what was lacking in the context of French fascism, the ecosystem, the political ecosystem of French fascism, was a Mussolini, was a Hitler. There was no gravitational leader who could rally these parties together. And Gav, you, you made mention to 1923, right? Hitler spends a very cushy, uh, less almost 12 months in jail for his attempted treason. Uh, and in that 12 months, what happens to the Nazi party? It splinters because this gravitational leader, Adolf Hitler, is not there to, to be the glue that ties all these parties together. Let me suggest, in other words, and I'll finish this now, Janet, had there been an American Mussolini or an American Hitler, these scattered parties would have posed a much greater uh, threat than they did. Thank you so much, Richard. We're turning now to the historian and political theorist, Dr. Matthew Spector. Matthew is the author of two books, Habermas, an intellectual biography with Cambridge University Press, and The Atlantic Realists, Empire and Political Sort Between Germany and the United States, which was published just last year by Stanford University Press. He's a senior fellow at the Institute for European Studies at Berkeley, as well as a faculty member in the history department at Santa Clara University. Matthew is also the associate editor for the journal History and Theory. Matthew, how has your research explained the concept of America First for our volume? How does this concept of America First help explain important links between this country's past and this country's present. Furthermore, would you say that the America First concept itself is inherently fascist? Well, thank you, Janet, and thank you all for coming. Um, those are challenging questions that we, uh, my co-author and I uh, try to answer in, the, in, the, uh, in our chapter on America First, 
a slogan with a history from 1880 to the present, which we, which we chart and analyze. Uh, and I can only gesture at what we, what we do in that, um, in that piece uh, in my, my brief five minutes uh, here. Uh, but I think this is really about a story about totem and taboo. Um, America First was completely taboo as a, uh, a slogan in American political discourse until Trump broke the taboo during his campaign in 2015. Um, and in, in recent years, with Marjorie Taylor Greene founding an America First caucus, it has become a totem, right? It is um, a, you know, a, a, a powerful rallying point for a new far-right politics um, in American history. So how did we get from taboo to totem? Well, the reason it was tabooed um, and the reason that Trump was scandalous in using it in 2015 and onwards was uh, because of the history of the America First Committee. The America First Committee was founded in 1940 by a number of Yale law students with establishment backgrounds and a lot of, uh, a lot of money behind them. The Vicks Vapo Rub Fortune and the CEO of Sears Roebuck were down with, uh, with the America First uh, project. The America First Committee uh, opposed American intervention in World War II. And it became the largest anti-war movement in American history with 800,000 member, members, 400 chapters uh, all over the country. And the historiography, uh, so why did it become, what, what about its history made it taboo? Well, as you may know from the Philip Roth plot against America idea where, pre where Lindbergh, the, the, the president of the AFC, uh, you know, in a counterfactual universe becomes president and takes, takes the U.S. out of the war. Essentially, by Trump endorsing or seeming, seeming to endorse the legacy of the America First Committee, he seemed to be soft-pedaling Nazism or saying that Nazism was not such, was, there was not, it was not a necessary or just war. Um, and it was a kind of dog whistle to the anti-Semitism of Lindbergh, which was pronounced. However, uh, the historiography, hi historians of the America First Committee have debated whether this is a fair, whether it's fair to, to, to call this committee uh, fascist. And so my co-author and I, in our piece, tried to assess the adequacy of several different um, uh, conceptual labels for approaching the history of the America, uh, approaching the America First Committee, but also the broader history of the slogan. Is it, a, you know, and so to Janet's question, is it an essentially fascist concept? Um, we wanted to know whether the categories of fascism, populism, nationalism, nativism, and isolationism were adequate to this phenomenon. And what we found was that it, the the committee's reputation for isolationism and populism was not merited, um, that it was much more of a nationalist, nativist, and fascist adjacent committee. The, the membership of the AFC, there was a, a great deal of overlap with the Silver Shirts and the Klan. Uh, the Klan used America First as, wa as one of its official slogans, the second Klan, that is, um, so we looked at the, the history of the America First Committee, and um, we, 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 we argued that it was not fascist, but fascist adjacent, that there were a lot of fascists and um, uh, anti-Semites who, who were drawn to it. In the chapter, we also look at the roots, the historical roots of the slogan, because it doesn't originate in 1940, 1941. It goes back to the 1880s. It goes through the 1920s. The Klan uses the, uh, the symbol, um, the slogan. But also figures like Wilson and Harding uh, and uh, Charles Evan Hughes and William Hurst. What America First meant initially was, are you an American first? Uh, if you are a hyphenated American, can, can we trust you? Do, is, your, is the American part of your hyphenated identity most pronounced? So we look a little bit at that. We also look at uh, the history of the America First discourse between 1945 
uh, and Trump, looking at paleoconservatives, um, which is another sort of another strand that feeds into um, uh, the modern uh, the modern American right. Uh, and Pat Buchanan's 1992 speech, where he uses America First um, as a kind of critique of Reaganite policies on free trade and immigration. Sam Francis, uh, a PhD intellectual and advisor to Buchanan, uh, explicitly located Pat Buchanan in a tradition affiliated to Charles Lindbergh. And so my co-author and I try to highlight continuities and discontinuities in the meaning of the slogan um, over time, over, over a long period of time. Um, but this is a slogan with a varied history used by figures on the left, right, and center. It doesn't have uh, an essence. Uh, I don't think it's an essentially fascist concept, but it has been a concept useful for fascists to think with and is a powerful American contribution to diasporic global fascism today. Uh, and one last thought, why does the slogan endure? Why would a slogan like this endure for 140 years? I think it's because in one symbol, it condenses positions on uh, immigration policy and foreign policy into one package. It summons two fantasies of loss, uh, uh, the loss of American sovereignty and the loss of American whiteness, and it combines uh, reflections on who do we want to be as Americans, questions of identity, with questions of action. What are we entitled to do in international affairs, and how do we feel about the encumbrances of the international community? And the final, final word, which is that I don't think that America First was ever um, a fascist concept, but it has become a useful part of a contemporary politics that I would, that my co-author and I would call fascist. So it's fascist for the first time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. And now we welcome Dr. Alexander Reed Ross. Alexander is a geographer and a fellow at the Center for Analysis of the Radical Right in the UK as well as a senior data fellow at the Network Contagion Research Institute. Wow, what a title. <laughs> Alex currently teaches in the Earth, Environment, and Society program at Portland State University, and his efforts at mapping the far right have been featured in, for example, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and many other major news sources. The Portland Mercury named his book called Against the Fascist Creep, one of the best books of 2017. Alex, you have identified notable continuities between American fascism and the American vigilante tradition. What are the links between the two in the Pacific Northwest? And given these links, what do people need to know most urgently, do you think, about this part of the United States, this region? That's a, uh, such a good question. Thank you so much. Um, as, uh, as Janet said, I'm actually a geographer, not a trained historian, so I feel a little outclassed on this panel. Also, I'm going off of about four hours sleep, and I spent all yesterday flying over here from Oregon. So, and then there's the fact that I wrote up these notes while eating a really, really spicy hot pot in Chinatown. <laughs> so I'm like really <laughs> discombobulated. But at the same time, I, I think like one of the most important things that I kind of stumbled upon while I was tracking the far right vigilante activity that was taking place in 2020 was that this is inextricable from the history of the United States and the history of the founding of Oregon. There were so many more vigilante incidents in Oregon than anywhere else. It was shocking. And when I ran a statistical geographical model, to try and assess what those variables were, some things that came back were kind of unsettling, like uh, extreme reactionary police, like sheriff's organization. Um, and so I think when we 
consider the founding of Oregon as a settler state in the 1800s, we have to keep in mind that vigilantism was an essential part of the fabric of the police because they didn't have police. <laughs> they had a committee of a thousand eyes, which was maybe like a rancher and his son, but nobody knew that and it was a really scary thing to put up on a sign. So you had a bunch of vigilante committees and this became kind of a tradition in Oregon which was used once the police came about against the police to actually assert the autonomy of the settlers who lived there. And when I say the settlers who lived there, there was a exclusion, a racial exclusion policy in Oregon when it was first established so that black settlers could not move to Oregon. And they pitched that as if it was to avoid the conflict of the Civil War. But it was actually, if you look at what was going on, uh, because the first law enforcement issue that took place in Oregon was over land rights, they wanted to make sure that black settlers in Oregon would not team up against the whites with the natives who, were th who they were genociding at the time. So it's a combination of the genocide of native people in Oregon and the exclusion of black people in Oregon that brings the settler reality to fruition through vigilantism, often a especially once we pass from the pragmatic phase of vigilantism into the traditional phase of, of vigilantism, let's say from uh, the 1880s to the 1920s, uh, it's the enforcement of the settler mentality even against some of the political elites. You really see that once they're fighting against the Chinese and trying to also exclude the Chinese, um, and I mean, you know, working class organizations um, as well, white working class organizations in Oregon. Um, they are trying to fight with the mayor because the mayor, you know, obviously sees some exigency to having low wage workers in town that they can rely on. So there are all of these economic and social and political issues that go into Oregon as an exclusionary settler state into the 20th century when you have the Klan showing up. And that's really where you have the mythology of the vigilante state effectively uh, taking over from the traditional phase um, because it's no longer practical to have a committee of a thousand eyes or anything like that. It's more of a statement that we're still here, we're still the settlers that you know we were 50 years ago and um, everything else is you know, just a uh, facade. So that's why the Klan was particularly important in Oregon. It wasn't because in Oregon it was a very violent organization. It was pretty violent and threatening, but not like it was in some of the other places in the United States in the 20s. Instead, it kind of built itself as like a self-help organization. To some extent, like uh, they had like pyramid schemes, like life insurance policies and stuff like that, of course. Um, but really, the Klan was the invisible empire. It was, it was so prominent in the state, it was so intertwined in the governor's office, in the mayor's office in Portland, that um, you had to contend with it. The Klansmen were, there was, there was like a hundred Klansmen who were deputized into the Portland Police Department. Um, and that's the thing. When you talk about the police and you talk about vigilantism, you can't set them apart from each other per se, although they can start fighting. There's always this porous border space that I kind of, I uncovered this kind of thing when I was really awful. <laughs> um, the kind of segue into the fascist movement, which draws together some of the old clan, but also the captain of the Portland Red Squad, which was like an auxiliary police uh, organization that was monitoring the uh, the working class organizations, unions, um, dock workers, that kind of thing. And so that was kind of, this is kind of like the meat and potatoes. I'm looking at this note here, mmm, hot pot. <laughs> I don't know why I wrote that. Um, of, of, my, of the essay that I wrote is, is showing how once fascism comes around their symptomatic in a sense of a broader settler tradition that's become mythologized 
in what they would call uh, the frontier justice, right? The vigilantism, which even people in Illinois and whatever would say, you know, if the workers are getting too rowdy, it's time for some frontier justice. Well, that was Oregon, and uh, I don't know, a lot has changed in Oregon, but um, it's, it's easy to see continuities uh, between the vigilante tradition that was happening up until World War II and the effort to transplant it into the post-war order, uh, specifically territorially trying to develop a the old form of sovereignty, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an idea of sovereignty, the sovereign citizens, the militias, the posse comitatus. It's this whole kind of um, territorial phenomenon, which is why I found that so fascinating as a geographer. And I would thank everybody who participated in this book for helping kind of hold my hand while I sort of stumbled through uh, as an untrained historian Working, uh, working out, you know, what I was trying to find in, in the article. Thank you so much, Alex. <laughs> Thank you for these questions. Many of the sentiments uh, that I've been reading in your questions will flow very nicely into the next panel. If I don't get to all of them, then it's very likely that Gabrielle will. I'm going to combine just reading some of them out loud and invite our panelists to respond. Which institutions would be, in your view, the most vulnerable from the movement toward governmental autocracy? Which institutions are the strongest, do you think, to defend against authoritarianism? Was Henry Ford, beside being uh, um, um, Hitler's hero, uh, involved in financing American fascist organizations. Hitler was in jail in the 1930s and Donald Trump has been accused of sedition. Um, could Trump gain momentum if convicted? You see how we're pointing into the next session already, but at the same time, I think it's testament to all our concerns. And I thank you for these kinds of approaches that combine origins and uh, the present. Um, and one more um, a question on all our minds. Is it sane for Jews in America today to be on the alert for when it's time to leave? Um, flashback to the 1930s, of course. Um, and um, with that, um, I just want to thank you for these kinds of approaches. And over to our panelists for some uh, reflections and responses. No, I think you should just pitch in. Okay. <laughs> this is where it loosens up. Richard just has, Richard just has ice written on his thing right here. I'm being a tattletale. <laughs> no, that, that's true. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> God. I'm not being dragged off the stage. Okay. Um, so no, I mean, just to verify, I would say that the most, to reformulate the wording, perhaps, hopefully not without, you know, felicity, uh, ICE would be the most, uh, would be the governmental organization most prone to fascistic tendencies. There seems to be a comfort with using the word fascistic, uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead. But, um, they're clearly on the front line of what they perceive to be a national sort of defense against the, the outsider, right? Permit me to suggest that the presidency itself, so as, as someone who in various public venues like Huffington Post actually declared his view that Trump is a fascist, uh, you will perhaps be reading about what his um, Camarilla are promising with a second administration, right? Should he gain the presidency again, right? Uh, Miller and his associates are saying, you, you know, you better watch out because the first administration is, was just the, you know, clearing of our throats. And among the things that they are promising is the stripping of uh, birthright citizenship, right? You, you've perhaps heard this. They will proceed with a very much more strenuous effort 
to, and, and of course ICE then becomes part of this, does it not? Of um, uh, supposing that people who were born in the United States wrongly will have that citizenship stripped away. So anyone who knows the first thing about Nazi anti-Semitism, of course, this sounds like the Nuremberg Laws, right? So um, this, it seems to me, is something that we should be very concerned about uh, in a second Trump presidency. It will, it will, the call will come from inside the House, uh, so to speak. Uh, just the question of Ford, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, Henry Ford, did he finance uh, fascism? Well, there's an offshoot, yet again, of the, of the Klan. Um, they called the Black Legion, black because of the uniforms, uh, who considered the, the mainstream clan of the 20s and 30s to, to be too soft, if you can believe it, right? and uh, proceeded to uh, create a splinter group called the Black Legion. They were strongest in Ohio and Michigan and worked to enforce uh, racialism uh, in the assembly line of, among other places, uh, Ford. And uh, I mean, I would defer to uh, Dr. Gordon for um, a more granular answer. I mean, just a general comment about, I mean, I'm not a professional prognosticator about contemporary politics, but um, when I think about the threat of fascism in America, I, I, I don't think about it in terms of Reichstag moments and uh, you know, the erection of, of a European-style dictatorship. And in the kind of fascism debate that we've been having over the last five years, many people have said, well, it can't be fascism because we're not in a proto dictatorial we're not you know we're not in a, we're not approaching dictatorship and even though many of us are now worried about what a trump a second trump administration would look like i still think that that's a red herring to imagine fascism on the model of uh you know a classic interwar european dictatorship when i worry about fascism in america i just i worry about the violence of everyday life the coarsening of um the, the coarsening of politics, the injection of, of, of violence, the, the criminalization, well, maybe not the criminalization of opposition, but the, um, just the, the sense of an internal enemy. Um, and, uh, but I, I don't have any, so, so that's how, where I would look to fascism is a sort of a deterioration of our political culture more broadly. Um, um, but, um, I don't have any specific comment on what, which of our institutions is most resilient in, 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 in that respect. I, I just want to say one, raise one question. I make this point in all of the points, but what do we gain by deciding what can we do as a national security group? I, I guess I'm, I'm nervous that a label distracts people from really trying to look at the actual Do you want me to answer that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. That's it's a good. It's a good. No, it's a good question because, of course, the emotionalism, right, inherent, and uh, not to sound uh, flippant, but of course, the the word fascism has been overused for decades, right? As I quipped in our last panel together, uh, the parent who took away your your bong in the 1960s was a fascist, right? Uh, how dare you? So this, this overuse of the phrase, right, brings to mind the, the boy who cried wolf. And of course, what we forget is that the, at the end of the story, the wolf comes. So um, I, I understand, I, I had a, a conversation with a very eminent scholar, not, not in the room today, uh, who has publicly said it can't be fascism, and then privately messaged me and said, you know my family in your state don't like it. Uh, they're Trumpsters, they're Trump supporters. They didn't say the word Trumpster. Uh, sounds slightly pejorative, I suppose. But um, he said, I have Trump supporting family in Ohio and they, they wouldn't like it. So what are the stakes? As scholars, we have a commitment to categories of analysis owing to their heuristic value. If we fancy ourselves public intellectuals and we don't want to tilt an audience, right? I can't imagine somebody here 
uh, or broad, more broadly, saying, well, I wasn't going to vote for him until you called him fascist, and now I'm going to. So I, I think you're right, of course, that there we, the distraction then comes when we have this cottage industry, right? Another panel, what is fascism? Well, it's this, but it's not that, right? So there, there's a, the British have this wonderful expression, pettifoggery, right? There's this pettifoggery that, that you get, endless iterations, right? Well, I'd need to see the armbands. Well, the swastika is not a quite this, the right dimensions. It can't be fascist. So I think there, you're right in one sense, this can be exhausting and, and you reach a point of diminishing returns. And I, uh, there'll be another person at the following panel who will strenuously disagree with me uh, and will say, well, we, if we argue that it's fascism, we bring different armaments to the fight. I, I, I think we need to bring the armaments that we have now, whether we call it fascism, fascistoid, fascistic, authoritarian. I mean, this is the peril that awaits us, I think, is uh, not to be underplayed. I have to say that um, we are completely a, uh, able to continue this in the next panel, and our panelists here can always ask questions in the next one. I want to give the last word to one of you who said, thank you all for the feel-good book of the season. <laughs> Join me in a few minutes for the next panel. Thank you to our panelists, Linda, Matthew, Richard, and Alex. We didn't add uh, any fine print in the uh, invitation for tonight's event that stamina was required. And in a perfect world, we would have a break right now where we could enjoy our wine and cheese uh, and then come back for round two. But in fact, um, we're going to reverse. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to do it the way we planned. Uh, and so I, I'm grateful for you all uh, being able to wait another half an hour or so before we have our uh, wine and cheese reception. Um, we are, if nothing, um, very uh, committed to this topic, and so you're going to hear um, a lot more uh, from us, although with three panelists instead of four, um, we may be a little bit uh, swifter. So without further ado, we are talking here about responses to fascism, uh, and let me briefly introduce our three eminent panelists. First to my left, Anna Dunsing is a postdoctoral fellow at the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies at the University of Virginia. She's writing a book about anti-fascism, black radicalism, and the politics of white supremacy in the United States. And she received her doctorate in history and African American studies from Yale in 2022. Usman Power Green. Uh, to my far left is a scholar of African-American social and political movements in the history department at Clark University. His first book, Against Wind and Tide, The African-American Struggle Against the Colonization Movement, from 2014 examines black American agitation against the American Colonization Society and the colonization movement to Liberia. And in between is Thomas Weber, professor of history and international affairs, as well as the founding director of the Center of Global Security and Governance at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. He's also a visiting fellow uh, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, and is the author of four books, including the important 2016 study, Becoming Hitler, The Making of a Nazi. Once again, we're talking less in this panel about the origins of fascism uh, and more about the responses to fascism. So Anna, if we can just kick it off with you. How have African Americans understood the concept of fascism in the context of US history? Uh, you have especially focused on the period between World War I and World War II, as well as the early post-war years. What could, you say, uh, what could you say are the dominant trends in how African Americans have understood this concept? Uh, so thank you so much for um, having me. And um, this, yeah, being part of this volume has been really special, so it feels great to come together and, and share with you all a conversation we've been having for, for quite a long time at this point. Um, so I will say my motivation for approaching the chapter as I did, which was looking to a kind of like big tent 
um, responses to fascism in the black public sphere in the interwar period. Um, part of it was in b engaging with the so-called fascism debate of this century. I found it really frustrating that so often claims of democracy in the United States as some kind of bulwark against fascism didn't really take seriously how um, little democracy has existed in the history of the United States and how you can't really make an argument um, for anything approaching a real and living democracy in this country since the 1960s. Um, so it, it, it seemed to me that a centering black history in these discussions just seemed vital. Um, and similarly, when I was reading literature about how Americans responded to fascism in the 20s and 30s, um, th I was feeling, you know, nobody was reading the black press, right? Nobody was sort of engaging with black intellectuals. And you know the 1930s and 40s was a time when the black press in the United States was at its um, sort of largest in terms of circulation and influence. So um, what was really exciting is crack, op crack open pretty much any black newspaper in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and you're going to see a very different conversation happening than what you would find in a mainstream press writ large. So I think to lead with an anecdote, um, one of the most famous black American journalists uh, of the interwar period. He was a journalist and historian. He was a Jamaican-American writer. His name was J.A. Rogers. And one of the things he was known for was these travelogues. He traveled a lot in Europe in the 20s and would send these really smart, um, oftentimes sort of funny and, and oftentimes really excited observations about, about what he saw in Europe. And he was covering Italy in 1927. And this was May 1927, his last dispatch from Milan. And he said, in a way that was very common in the black press, both deeply serious and kind of wry, he said, um, you know, I feel just like home in Italy because Italy has a north and a south and Italy has fascism. And, um, and, 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 but the way, he, and then he sort of pivots and, and says the mood in early, you know, fascist Italy reminded him of the stories he had heard about the reconstruction south um, and the steady, um, construction of the Jim Crow regime, both as like a legal system and as something enforced by what um, our previous panelists discussed at great length, right? This tangle of formal state violence and vigilante violence and the blurred lines between the two. Um, and I, I need to let you know that one example is, is just, yeah, one of innumerable examples of how the black press really from the beginning, and, and I could have given you examples from 1922 covering, you know, days before the March on Rome, um, comparisons between um, the black shirts of Italy and the Klan were very commonplace. And um, what you start to see in, in taking a broad sampling of how um, the black press, for instance, was responding to uh, first you know, Mussolini's Italy and then also the Nazi movement in Germany and eventually Hitler's fitful rise to power and um, consolidation of power, essentially a few themes. Um, one is um, black commentators writ large, and I mean mostly black Americans, but also very much a kind of black diasporic tradition. Really from the beginning, it was stunning to me how quickly they understood the racial and colonial engines of fascism um, and took those really seriously. Uh, another is seeing somehow in the mood of fascist movements and fascist regimes something that was really reminiscent of, of Reconstruction and it's um, both uh, strategic dissolution on the ground and the kind of abandonment of the federal government of any kind of real abolitionist democracy. Um, and then the third theme, which is the one that's most tough to parse, is black press commentators in particular and black intellectuals and also in sort of oral histories, in blues music, right, sort of everywhere in this time, they really seem to understand um, that um, to challenge the idea that there was, that we should understand democracy and fascism as opposed political systems. They seem to really understand and recognize and be worried about the murkiness, um, really, again, from the beginning, from the 20s and early 30s. And moreover, and I think this is really key to bring into the conversation, they also didn't just understand that, right, fascism was this foreign thing we were comparing um, something like American racism to, but there was a kind of multi-directional, um, awareness, right? Um, so they would often describe, you know, during covering like the 1932 elections in Germany, um, describe um, the Nazi party or Hitler using the names of a Mississippi lawmaker, right? So sort of translating it in both directions. And also sometimes at the time, you know, J.A. Rogers, when the 
Nuremberg laws are passed, again, he kind of quips in the newspaper, he says, I wouldn't be surprised if Hitler just stole these from Jim Crow laws. What are Jim Crow laws but fascist laws? And I'm sure Rogers didn't know, you know, what took a, you know, scholarship many decades later proving that the Nazis were studying American racial jurisprudence. The Nazis deeply admired the Johnson Reed Act, that, that immigration law that Dr. Gordon mentioned, right? So they understood it wasn't just this sort of foreign thing coming into the United States. They understood that it was, it sort of was flowing in both directions. Um, and then the, the one thing I'll distinguish then is that you do, especially by the rise of, of the, n the Nazi dictatorship, you do see sort of two distinct, a uh, kind of split, which um, is important to mention, but only to a point. One, you have a kind of more um, broad, accessible, sort of liberal black anti-fascism, which is arguing, right, that even as it appears in the United States, it is un-American, right, and the struggle is about purging the United States of these fascist tendencies to achieve a, a real democracy. And then you have a more black radical um, tradition which is embodied in figures like W.E.B. Du Bois, the great um, Trinidadian intellectuals George Padmore and Claudia Jones, who say, you know, and this is most famously embodied in Amy Césaire's 1951 essay, Discourse on Colonialism, who essentially say, uh, this is in fact the full uh, achievement of the West. Right, fascism is sort of racial imperialist capitalism reaching its highest form, and it's not new, and it's not aberrant. It is, in fact, a kind of culmination. But why I think those are distinctions up to a point is that these positions shared space in black newspapers. They shared space at demonstrations. The, the most, uh, I think, important example, even thinking about our, our very city, is the hands-off Ethiopia movement, which was this massive sort of big tent coalition formed in late 1934 and early 1935, um, right up in Harlem at the Abyssinian Baptist Church in response to Mussolini's threatened invasion and eventually in real invasion of, of, of Ethiopia. And so you do see a, essentially a winning out of the more kind of um, liberal black anti-fascist tradition in the context of the war itself when anti-fascism became patriotic rather than subversive and there was space to make claims of a, of a kind of full-throated American anti-fascist tradition. Um, the most famous example is the Double V campaign, which was an argument um, first put forth by the black newspaper, the Pittsburgh Courier, which essentially said, um, how do we reckon with fighting for democracy in a segregated army? Well, we're fighting for democracy both abroad and at home. But of course, then the black radicals push past it and say, no, we're, f we're fighting against fascism both abroad and at home. Um, and the last thing I'll say, the kind of legacies, which which um, will will get us up to sort of what can we learn from this black anti-fascist tradition for this present moment. Um, I was really struck in particular by the archives of the summer of 1945 and how common it was for um, in the black public sphere to have a deep skepticism that by simply, you know, in May 1945, mind you, right, that the, that the collapse of Germany meant that fascism was done. Right, sort of we've be we have beat Hitler, but not his ideas was the common refrain. And an understanding that there was this intoxicating um, amnesia settling upon Americans, that they could tell a story about themselves as a nation having beat the Nazis, and therefore it could never happen here. Um, and the black public sphere is very skeptical and very aware of that amnesia setting in. Another really important leg legacy is that of um, a sense of mutual struggle and solidarity um, that that it's never just about one group, right? That there was a black anti-fascist impulse to build solidarities with all racialized and colonized peoples and to understand that it's never just one group. You have to see your, your you have to build large um, coalitions toward, toward liberation for all. And then I think finally, um, thinking about how we get into the context of the 1950s, the real, um, um, other legacy worth noting in black anti-fascist politics is an understanding of the ways the formal systems of sort of government and um, policing and justice in the United States were so fully set up to disproportionately target folks on the left, right? Um, and how often American formal investigations into fascist movements would often conclude that the threat that fascist movements posed was because it distracted from the bigger threat of the left. Right, and this is often framed sort of black and red scares emerging in the 1940s and 1950s. So an understanding of who are these systems set up to surveil 
detain, blacklist, and deport, um, and really fearing the long-term legacies of those structures of power um, coursing into this century. So thank you. Thank you, Anna. If I can turn, uh, Usman, to your chapter, and those of you that get the book, of course, will be very, very impressed with how these two chapters really flow uh, logically from one into the other. Um, and Usman, your chapter continues the story of the black anti-fascist struggle to the present. Uh, how have African Americans changed their views on fascism over time, saying from the period that we just heard uh, Anna leave off with the 1950s up to the present? Well, first of all, let me thank everyone for coming and, and for being on the panel. I should, I definitely want to do that. I was thrilled to have a chance to, to actually see these authors who were in this volume together, um, coming in late, a little bit late on, on the scene. Um, as mentioned, you know, my chapter can literally picks up the ball from Anna and moves uh, forward in time. Uh, and, but, but I was provoked by a very specific idea, and that was the delegitimization of the term fascism uh, within African Americans, right? So when you look, think about the 60s and 70s, and certainly by the 80s, going back to the comment, I think maybe, maybe Richard made that like, oh, everything's fascist, right? And so there's a tremendous like delegitimization, like, oh, you know, everything that you know is bad happens to black people is because of some like fascist, uh, um, you know, tendency or whatever. Uh, and so I was sort of provoked by the use of the term, the rhetoric around fascism. And so what that did was it took me on an investigation into the ways in which African Americans, after the period um, you know, that, that Anna talks about, utilize the notion of fascism. And this actually, in some ways, answers, Professor Gordon, your question, which is what do, we, what do black activists, particularly during black power, right, the famous ones, Black Panthers and others, what do they gain by constantly saying, you know, American fascism, or as, as they describe it, it, racism and fascism as two sides of the same coin, right? What do they gain? Their response, and I, I write about Angela Davis in 2016, actually, as our beginning point, when she discusses the Trump presidency as, you know, you know, we have to be aware of these fascist tendencies that she felt like she's beginning to see immediately, right? And then going backwards in time to the early 70s when Davis is active um, and using these fascist analogies as a way to help wake people up, right, to the concerted effort on the part of people in establishment positions, her sort of, you know, the, the chasing by the FBI and others and framing of her, of course she gets off, and the way in her view she understood all of the different actions on the part of the state Right, working in concert to oppress black radicals as these fascist tendencies and fascism as being an apt phrase to use. So why use it? For legitimacy, right? So if we can say the state trooper that you know, arrests me or beats, you know, goes in Attica shouting white supremacy as they're beating people up in Attica, if we can say that they're fascist, there's an effort to delegitimize that violence against black people. Right, and so that that was the reason they tried to do it is they're trying to drag people along with them and say, y'all remember fascism? That's what's happening here, and you need to see it for what it really is—a concerted effort towards genocide. Right? They're sort of really trying to harp on the language um, that sort of comes out of the Holocaust, that comes out of sort of the era, intentionally. Right? As using overblown. Maybe, you know, as Gav pointed out in my comments, maybe they used inaccurate, <laughs> inadequate rhetoric back then, but it was very intentional, right? Um, and, you know, what did it gain? You know, ultimately, I think that it, it you know, kind of going full circle and, and thinking about Davis's claim, you know, in 2016, I think in ways it did actually um, help bring African-American activists together. And what I mean by that is, most of who, who I write about and also who Anna writes about are, are sort of black actors or black radicals. They're not like mainstream politicians, right? So some of the mainstream politicians that um, sort of emerge and then, you know, think of Ronald Dellum, something like that, emerge in the 70s, um, what the results were were even some of them, right, elected officials actually saying, like, no, we actually were, were believed that there might be a fascist conspiracy uh, happening, a racist conspiracy that's racist and fascist that's actually happening in the 70s. 
And so what's not in my chapter, but I did go on sort of afterwards and do more research into anti-Klan activism, particularly in prisons in upstate New York in the 70s, right? And the ways in which mainstream elected you know, black politicians, particularly after Attica, are like, oh my gosh, this is actually examples of what people, you know, who were deemed radicals were saying, we're seeing this infiltration uh, thorough and concerted, and it's something people need to take seriously. Um, and so ultimately what uh, my chapter does and, and you know, what I learned a lot, you know, sort of doing research for this, because I'd you know, heard snips of it and I was aware of it, but until I sort of sat down with this conversation that everyone's having for the volume and you know, having a chance to, to listen to Anna and read her work, I really begin to think more and more about actually the answer to Dr. Gordon's question, which is like, you know, what is, is there actually any utility in using it? Um, uh, and, uh, and what was the sort of potential outcome? I, I, I think that um, in extreme ways in 79 with the Greensboro massacre, I'm sure many people remember that event, uh, the shooting down of black activists and, and white activists who are part of a, a version of Communist Party in some ways sort of ends, it's not actually in my chapter, but in some ways is the height of this sort of view that, you know, this is the case Greensboro, North Carolina, but this, this concerted view of just blatant white violence, uh, you know, aimed towards African Americans and also obviously Communist Party members as a quintessential expression of the sort of fascist tendencies they're talking about. Um, so I'll stop there and um, yeah, look forward to, uh, to more conversation. So thanks. Thank you, Usman. <laughs> Obviously, this session is devoted to discourse in many respects. And um, while we've talked thus far about the discourse on fascism and how uh, appropriate it is for uh, the present day moment, uh, Tom, as we turn to you, one of the world's experts on the figure of Adolf Hitler, we get another wrinkle uh, in, in, in place here, um, by which I mean when Trump first ran for office in 2015, many people didn't just call him a fascist, they compared him directly to Adolf Hitler. Uh, and this has been one of the features of this very long debate. In your chapter, uh, you discuss the similarities and differences between the two figures, Hitler and Trump. Uh, where do those similarities and differences lie, and how would you weigh in more broadly on the utility of Hitler comparisons uh, in this present political moment. Thank you. Um, to ultimately, I think that the utility is relatively limited, as I will um, explain in a second. There is actually a similarity between Adolf Hitler and tr Trump, which is ultimately in the view of the state of nature. They ultimately have a kind of very um, vulgarized Hobbesian kind of dog eat dog view of human nature, and but ultimate and and they and they also have a similar view of themselves as geniuses in a kind of traditional sense. And in a way, I already see you laughing, but in a way, don't laugh, it, it because it is actually that serious. In a way, actually, also it is that serious, in the sense that. They both think in a kind of very old-fashioned way of what a genius is, going back to kind of 16th, 15th, 16th century ideas of genius. It's someone who has an innate um, talent to, uh, f of to, to see the hidden architecture of the world and to create something totally new. And they both believe in that. Take that seriously if you want to understand Hitler and Trump. But when it comes to overcoming the state of nature, I would argue that they're fundamentally different. Because ultimately, when it comes to the domestic sphere, Adolf Hitler ultimately thinks that society and states and the strong state is possible. In fact, it is, the, it is a strong state that will tame the, sta uh, the, the um, state of nature, while internationally he thinks it can't be tamed, but they, it will be done through a combination, through kind of permanent war but also permanent pursuit of security, uh, traditional pursuit of, uh, of security. While with Trump, ultimately there is the, I mean, the kind of the, the, f the famous quip of, um, of um, Margaret Thatcher that there's no such thing of society would actually uh, work much better with Donald Trump than with uh, Thatcher. And it's ultimately the view that 
um, there is no state, there is no society. In a way, if you want to kind of understand, in a way, how both the starting point of both men is is the imagine a world without power. Imagine how that can be governed. Imagine how the world of um, where piracy has 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 emerged, where um, clans have emerged, where there have been new ways of trying to tame. Uh, to, to tame that kind of quasi-anarchical world. And it is here where Trump's answer is extremely different because the, he's not a collectivist, as one would expect of or commentarian, as one would expect of a fascist. He's an extreme individualist, so I think you've got to look at a, a vulgarized version of Ayn Rand's um, extreme individualism, but you also need to look at maybe the kind of subculture of the mafia culture of New York City if you want to understand uh, Trump. You need to look at how he believes that in a system like this, there can be um, the this kind of anarchy can be tamed through individual power relationship through deals. And it's this kind of intricate web of power relationships that can be tamed, that can tame a society both domestically, but also internationally. This is also why Trump's behavior in the international sphere is fundamentally different, I believe, um, from Adolf Hitler, which is why I personally think that using the either these kind of comparisons with, uh, t not comparisons, I think in a way, I've, I've just tried to lay out that comparisons can be uh, very fruitful, but the kind of an easy equation up obfuscates the problem. And the same is true of, fa of fascism. I think the, uh, of course, to on, on one level, this is a, a semantic issue. It becomes on how you define fa uh, fascism. Obviously, we can define it in a very broad sense, but then the question is, is what is its still heuristic value? You can, of, of course, also say there is no essence to fascism. Fascism changes, sure, fair enough. But how far do you go? If you go too far, then it just becomes uh, meaning bad. Um, or something of that kind, and, and, and lose its heuristic value. And I also don't really think that this is a kind of issue of, uh, of, of crying wolf and then asking whether Trump is already a wolf or not. It is more a question is if, if an alligator is around the corner shouting wolf, the, the wolf is coming might not be the way best way of trying to figure out what you can do against the alligator. So in that sense, uh, my point would be to say, let's get right what the problem is. And the problem here is not whether, whether or not Trump and Trumpism is better or worse than fascism, but it is what is specific to the threat. And if I can just have maybe an, a, another minute or two, is the, what I would also really say is, is that with these comparisons uh, to the past and the vacations of the 1920s and 1930s, I think we would be much better served to look at the underlying drivers of radicalization um, if we w rather than to look at the consequences of them because I think it is there where we, say we, where we see the, the real similarities. Um, the, that has a lot to do with the role of crisis perception to the belief to be living in a world of permanent crisis where the individual and collective survival of uh, is no longer guaranteed. It is at moments of that kind that people turn towards um, radical new solutions, and this is the moment when demagogues have um, a chance. Um, and, and again, the, the outcome of that kind of um, democratic br breakdown can be very different, and it would be very useful, I think, for in the U.S. context to look at maybe more at the kind of slide towards liberal democracy in other countries than at 1933's Germany. But more broadly, I think we really may want to look at the, um, the underlying problems um, that is driving this radicalization and that is tearing not just American society but other societies apart and destroying the political um, culture um, of institutions. It's the erosion of pre-political values, of solidarity, empathy, to still also have empathy for an opponent, um, trust, tolerance, moderation, patience, all kinds of issues of that kind. So unless we address those, I think, even if we survive the next four years, we will not, a, a democracy will still not survive. So I think it is really there
where we actually have got to, to mend the American political system and the global political system. And also there, I think, in a way, the, uh, we, we may also all ask ourselves whether we're actually part of the solution or part of the, um, the, um, the problem. Have we not maybe all become distrust machines? Have we not maybe all be, be the kind of uh, people who are just cynical towards everything? Are we not always just um, expect, I mean, uh, are we, for instance, um, developing empathy towards people with whom we're disagreeing? And in a way, this brings us in a, in a, back to the idea uh, to, to, to fascism. Maybe if people are adamant that they're not fascists, maybe let's try to, empath uh, to, to develop empathy towards them. Not sympathy, but empathy. And maybe that will actually also help us to understand where they're coming from, but also to help find find common ground, and even to uh, if there is sorry, a common ground on a on on, on a different kind of level. I'm, I'm I mean I'm not saying on in in terms of political goals, but if we for instance see that there's maybe still something that unites us, we can then actually also help to maybe convince them why they're why they're wrong and just shouting fascism fa f f uh, fascism at them might not be the best way of convincing them. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> so what I propose um, in our final 10 minutes is to give each of our panelists the opportunity to respond to um, several of the questions which I'm going to um, combine here um, in our last little section. And of course, if there are any questions from the first round that you would also like to respond to, feel free to do that. Um, but the great news is that we're on, on, uh, on schedule to get to our wine and cheese reception <laughs> before too long. And uh, that's, that's the best news of all, perhaps. Um, OK, so um, with respect to Donald Trump, there are two questions that sort of um, drift in the same direction. Uh, one in involves whether um, Donald Trump, now of course an ex-president, uh, is not concerned about empowering anti-Semites on the right because he feels that as far as his own family is concerned, uh, and of course here he's, we're talking about uh, Ivanka and Jared Kushner and uh, grandkids, he's able to protect his immediate family members who are Jews and he has very little concern about empowering anti-Semites in his coalition. A uh, related question, I suppose, is, is Elon Musk a fascist because of his role in creating a space on Twitter for the most uh, vicious kind of um, right-wing extremism, among, among other things? Um, those are the sort of two questions relating to uh, the contemporary far right uh, and its anti-Semitic dimensions. On the uh, exact opposite uh, wing of the political spectrum, um, and of course reflecting present day turmoil on college campuses, uh, another question asks whether the far left in its own extremism today uh, sh should or could be called fascistic, uh, and whether there's any risk uh, in what might be called a left-wing form of intolerance. And then finally, um, and maybe this is a way to kind of sum everything up, um, did you discuss putting a question mark after the, after the title of your book? Maybe I'll close us out with that, uh, with an answer to that question. Um, but perhaps if uh, Anna and then Usman and then Tom could take us through any of those questions uh, that you feel comfortable answering, we can move forward that way. Sure. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm going to sort of thread through some of these very quickly, which is one. I mean, I there 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 was a moment um, in my own research where I, you know, because often people ask, you know, how what is how is fascism defined in your in your project in your book? Um, and there was something I sort of wanted to, I felt like I wanted to step back from my own role in the fascism debate and how I was sort of giving a grand narrative of what fascism is in my story because it did mean something in the minds and writing and organizing and activism of my historical figures. Um, and I, I realized part of why I felt this element of, of U.S. history and black diasporic history had not been taken seriously is because of this need to be like, oh, it was all hyperbole. It was all an analogy. And like, we don't need to take it seriously. But it was really stunning to me how often the black anti-fascist analytic did not only shed light on real, the ways that the American right of the interwar period was, was fond of fascism, was excited about it, also believed that their political projects could be seen as part of a global right-wing project. 
Um, so I think, you know, another important legacy that I, I really believe is a, we get out of studying black anti-fascist politics is it's, it's oftentimes they're less interested in the is it or isn't it, and they're more interested in the politics of watchfulness. Um, and they say the name doesn't, calling it fascist doesn't distract so much as invite conversations like the one we're having. Um, and I think that's especially confirmed, there's a framework I just think is so helpful to think about both fascism and anti-fascism, is it's global and messy from the beginning. Those, it's not just in the 60s that those terms are being used loosey-goosey, they are in the 20s. And it really becomes clear to me um, that people take up both fascism and anti-fascism, how they understand it and practice it where they are toward what they're facing. Right, and so I just think that, that, that precision is important and watchfulness is important and increasingly for me, that's what I'm more interested in these conversations than giving a hardened definition. Um, and I think like there are conversations to have about a left wing, um, like left wing racism, anti-Semitism, bigotries, but I think for me, if I am still having a basic framework that that seems to be a little too sort of totalitarianism horseshoe theory for me because I do believe in broad strokes, like to call it fascism is thinking of a right-wing reactionary anti-Marxist politics. Um, so I really do draw a line there. Um, but again, and so to the, is this person a fascist? Is this person a fascist? I feel less comfortable doing a diagnosis, but I am, I am inclined to say something like, oh, it's really interesting that Elon Musk's, you know, grandfather chose to move to the newly established apartheid South Africa, like that's an interesting decision he made. Um, I wonder why, right? Let's have the conversation from there. Um, but I'll, I'll stop myself there. These were really rich questions. Thank you all. Usman, if you want to go next. Yeah, I, um, I have a few different thoughts about it. I mean, I, you know, what most of my people I spend my time reading about are interested in. Um, even when using provocative language that offends people, there is something at the core that's a humanistic core, right? In other words, there is a sense that um, the goal is to help people who are the most vulnerable in society. I'm talking about black radicals, right? Um, and that that group of people need to have access to all the basics and then a sense of dignity, right? So for them, um, this is uh, something that's very important in the sense that it's not just about power, right? And so, you know, or if it is about gaining power, it's power rooted in this uh, sort of ideal, right? This sort of ideal. So in that sense, I think um, understanding left radical radicalism and violence um, is not the violence of itself, but the motive behind the violence to me is, you know, not to justify, but just to think about, think through the choice to actually think that you can engage in violent acts against the state, and that's gonna benefit you and your organization and the people you support, right? To actually believe that's true, you know, takes is a leap, right? Because more often than not, uh, the United States government, you know, as it turns out, is very effective at stopping people from, you know, s s seeking to use violence, you know, to forward any cause, right? And so um, when I fast forward in time and I think about sort of our, you know, contemporary moment, I still ultimately um, am driven by this, by the fascist analogy in trying to say, look at these different gatherings of the storm. And you know, to, to, to further Anna's point, you know, whether or not you know, the, the specific type of hurricane it is or tornado it is for the experts say is less important than the destruction it can do. So gather your stuff and let's go and talk about later what exactly type that was, right? I think that for a lot of activists that we're interested in, they are not you know, professional intellectuals and they don't write books and study this, right? They are seeing signs and they're saying, oh my gosh, this all looks so too eerily familiar to what could potentially happen to this collective group of people. Um, and so uh, I guess this is where you know, my interest in, in trying to teach about and learn more about uh, groups that I, honestly, that, that, that a lot of historians don't take that seriously, actually, uh, in terms of African you know, historians that study African American history. Um, you know, I'm sort of interested in taking them seriously, even if it feels overblown or, you know, maybe the evidence isn't as clear 
um, as a person who were to, you know, uh, to, to, to put a portrait of exactly what the fashion tendencies are. Um, so I think that might have answered part of the question, but at least that's what I was thinking about uh, as people were asking this question. So uh, I'll stop there. Tom? I certainly like the question of the question mark. I mean, I understand that you should never put a question mark in a book title, but <laughs> to 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 have it at least in uh, on our mind, I think is useful because I think then the the whole issue about fascism becomes interesting because then actually also you don't actually have got to say this definitely is fascism and only if you can tick tick all boxes um, is is this a useful enterprise but if you actually ask to actually say what is similar what is different here then I think you can actually really try to figure out what we are up against um, at the moment um, about um, the far left um, is there a left wing form of intolerance sure I mean Look, <laughs> look at 20th century European history. You'll find uh, a lot of left-wing um, in, 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 in intolerance. And uh, I mean, the, uh, un unfortunately, all uh, people from all political sides are perfectly capable of intolerance. Um, to, as with regards to Trump and anti-Semites, um, yes, I think that sounds right. I mean, I think the I think ultimately we have got to bear in mind Donald Trump really is he's transactional about everything. He's and and ultimately is he is in there for himself. He is in there for um his own glory. And also he what really drives him is to to try to avoid being humiliation. So anyone who can help him avoid humiliation and maybe even give him some kind of applause. He will he he will welcome. So and that's I think that's also in a way brings us back to, to fascism because I mean obviously there are fascists today in America. I mean no one is questioning that they're fascists in America, and we've already seen on January 6th that Trump was suddenly quite happy to uh, to to accept support from people where no one will doubt for a second that are fascists. And I think we're increasingly seeing here the same with um, anti-Semites and that um, as long as they cheer Trump and they don't hum humiliate him, Trump will be quite happy to, uh, to go along with that uh, support. With Elon Musk, um, again, I'm <sighs> I think in a way just like with Trump, I think the well, my, he's actually a slightly different uh, f uh, character from, you know, uh, from, from, from Trump. I think there are a lot of um, problems with him. I don't think it is the problem of fascism. Um, and in a way, it's, I would almost, even though I very happily focus on Elon Musk, I think in a way, I would rather focus on what we actually need to do with social media, more b both with X Twitter as well as more broadly, with social media, how we actually desperately need proper regulation of the digital world. Um, we need self-policing. It brings us back to pre-political values. It's up to us how we use social media. So I think that is what we really need to address. We need to address um, artificial intelligence and how that will be governed. Particularly, I mean, think about um, artificial intelligence in the hands of um, of information warriors and demagogues, and we need proper in governance of the game industry. I mean, the um, it is particularly in chat rooms of games where increasingly radicalization happens, where um, radicals meet, um, where um, and in, in radicalization and in violence is increasingly an emulation of. Uh, memes from uh, or from from themes from from um, from from games, so I think I would really focus on uh, governance of social media, AI, and games rather than on the uh, person of Elon Musk to figure out how to 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 save democracy and 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 our um, society and our world. And lastly, as I want to just maybe very briefly answer the question from the first half about institutions. Um, the maybe with the danger of becoming very unpopular here, I would say I have most trust in the ju the judicious into the courts. Um, 
including the Supreme Court. I mean, Donald Trump already was extremely disappointed at that his own appointees did not do what he expected uh, him to do. So I think um, if it really comes to it, my highest hope would be in the courts. I'm not necessarily saying that they will uh, that they will deliver what I hope that they will deliver, but compared to other institutions, uh, maybe the military, um, and uh, the the la very last point I want to say is is the role of the deep state. So I think in a way the um, the big danger I think really here is is that in the next Trump um, Trump presidency he would really um, do mass firing on the civil service in because he in a way he would rightly see that that was um, that 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 the deep state in a way did um, did stop him from doing unconstitutional things. And uh, the lesson of that is to do mass firings. And I think there we would ro also really hope that for those who are not fired, because obviously you can't fire everyone, that it is really there where there will be resilience. And there are also historical examples of that. I mean, think of 1920s Germany. There was a coup d'etat attempt in 1920. And one, and probably the main reason of why that coup failed was because of the deep state, so civil servants in Berlin basically just refused to go along. Whether or not there's a question mark, uh, or whether there should be a question mark after our title, I think it's up to you to figure that out by going out to our Rwandan cheese reception and procuring a copy of the book. Let me just remind you, only seven, only seven of the contributors were present here this evening in this bold experiment in uh, you know, getting an edited volumes participants to, uh, to weigh in on their, uh, on their chapters. There are five who weren't even here. Their topics, their chapters are enormously rich and also deserve uh, a look. So please, uh, we'll find our way uh, out to the uh, Great Hall. Um, we'll look forward to signing any copies sh should you like. And uh, thank you again for coming this evening.